to episode 10 of our FM COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, this week, we're jumping back into the pandemic manual, this time on the road to recovery. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Everybody's audio has been muted for quality purposes. And we're also going to have a Q&A portion on the session. So please enter your questions into the question box on your go-to panel. This episode and all of our past episodes can be found in IFMA's Coronavirus Resource Center. So please go to ifma.org slash coronavirus to check out all of those resources. And with that, let me turn it over to Joe Archie, who will be moderating today's session. Joe? Good morning. Thanks, Chris. My name is Joe Archie, and I'm the chair of the IFMA Foundation. Welcome to Pandemic Essentials, The Road to Recovery. A little repeat there. Thank you. The pandemic manual and today's presentation were made by the uh, generous support of ABM, Global Workplace Analytics, Plan On, the IFMA Association, and then here's a whole bunch of strong supporters, CEES Advisors, the IFMA Healthcare Council, the Hospitality Council, the Public Sector Council, and not to be forgotten, the San Fernando Valley Chapter huge supporter of the foundation. Thank you all. A special thanks to the IFMA staff, those behind the scenes people, Chris and Maureen, for helping us manage and direct this webinar, and to the foundation staff, Diane Levine and Christina Gonzalez. Today, we are most fortunate to have on the panel, Dr. Stephen Goldman. Uh, let me just say a couple of words. He's an international expert in business continuity, crisis management, disaster recovery, pandemic pre preparation <laughs> and response, and crisis leadership, the most important thing we need today. We also have Kathy Campbell, who is the National Director of Service Delivery with ABM Industries, and she's in the health, she manages the healthcare division. If I've got that correct, Kathy, you'll let me know. And Jenny Young, she is the chair of the IFMA Asian Advisory Board. So welcome. With that, I believe we're going to get kicked off on uh, today's uh, topics with road to recovery, reentry considerations, lessons from Asia, and enhanced cleaning and peace of mind. Oh, I can use some of that. A double dose, please. <laughs> with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Stephen Goldman. Great. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ifma. For supporting this webinar, everything they do in the manual. It's very nice, very good. All right, Chris, next slide. Um, those of you who saw the previous webinar should remember this slide. And I just want to bring it out again in three pillars, which you build an organization and now you're recovering an organization. You need people, you need facilities, you need connectivity. Without each of those, you, you can't bring the organization back. And again, I point out that the building is, in fact, a real building at MIT's campus. The architect did not crunch up the uh, plans to the uh, construction people. That is what it looks like. Anyway, uh, seriously, people, facilities, and connectivity, extremely important. Recovery. You should be planning a recovery now. Um, what considerations do you have for building reopening? What HR considerations? What do you do for social distancing? How's that going to work? Um, and you just, you know, it's easy to let out a building. It's easy to actually evacuate relatively a city. Everyone goes, take your laptop and leave. Bringing people back is tough. That's not going to be easy. So what group comes back first after facilities, of course, and after IT? Um, so you facilities may not need to deal with that specifically, but someone in your organization needs to. They need to know that. So if Department A needs Department B for it to function, the B needs to come back first. It's not logical necessarily. Um, you can bring back everyone at the same time or say, uh, a given department, is that going to be certain people than the rest? So these are the things that, that people need to think about. What about employee health monitoring? There are 50 states. It seems like there's 50 different criteria for monitoring employee health. Check with your local health agency, see what they require, see what they want to do. And I won't read the rest of this to you, but obviously safety and security is your key function. Social distancing, I mentioned that. Supply chain, and just as important, distribution chain. How is that restored? How is that balanced? You need to balance supply and distribution. Uh, supplies, restock, mail services, that's a key one. And then any uh, facilities project that you've had up uh, 
you know, a capital project or a delayed construction maintenance project, what's the status of that? Are we bringing that back? Are we putting it off to next year or what? Now on the website listed below, um, six readiness essentials, prepare the building, prepare the workforce, access control, social distancing, reduce touch points, increase cleaning, and last but hardly least is communication. Communicate everything you're planning on doing, how you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it. This is the, the key lesson learned from all of this is communication is so important. Now, um, since I'm in academia, I can steal stuff and call it research or bar call it referencing. So this I got from an ABM document and I modified it a little bit. For re-entry, if you look at the left, these are some considerations the landlord needs to think about. Again, modify, adapt, monitor, adapt, and adjust as necessary for your organization. So again, you can read all the list. Uh, I've already went through a few of them. On the left is the landlord. On the right is the occupier, or the uh, tenant. What do they need to think about? A lot of the same things we already talked about. You can read through those um, uh, on your own. Up above is government. Clearly in most uh, um, districts and most uh, jurisdictions, people need to understand what, what can come back first. The county I'm living in, for example, is not letting people in for another couple of weeks. The county is next door. People are already back. So there's a dichotomy of like what's important and what isn't. That's going to fall on you to realize, you know, what my county can do or state or city and what uh, the rest of the state or city is doing and how that deals with uh, what you're doing. And the bottom line, literally and figuratively here, is the individual. Ultimately, the individual is deciding, do I feel safe? When I come back to the office, what have they done? What are they going to be doing? And that's in facilities. That's going to be your area of expertise. They have to feel safe. They have to feel healthy. You have to feel like you care about them. And you know the other uh, half of this is they have family concerns. If you and your spouse are going back to the office, but your kids are still at home, what are you going to do? So again, all these factors have to come into play before a reentry is allowed. Like you said, easy to get people out, take your laptop and go home. Getting them back in is going to require a plan. Again, these are some issues to consider. I think this kind of summarizes what I've said. Uh, guidance, disinfection, you can read through that. And again, the bottom line, literally and figuratively, is, is communications. You not only speak, you listen. You don't hear, you listen. Listen to what your employees are telling you. This, I'm doing research on work from home and coming back, and this is an interesting one. So I call it mask confusion and mask chaos, mask masquerade, whatever you want to call it. So local government has lifted your face mask requirement. That's fine. As people come back to work, you notice the following four situations. One, everybody's wearing face masks. Two, most of the staff have face masks, a few do not. Three, a few have face masks, a few do not. And finally, four, none of the staff wear face masks. Is this going to be a problem? And the answer is yes. If it's number one or number four, you have consistency. Everyone's wearing a face mask and nobody's wearing a face mask. This is good. If some people are wearing face masks and a few do not, the human nature is. What's wrong with those people? Why are they not wearing face masks? This is gonna be some kind of human reaction to that. On the other hand, a few of the staff wear face masks, most do not, your, your brains go like, well, why are they wearing face masks and we're not? What's wrong with them? So especially if you have facilities cleaning staff have a policy, I would recommend all or none, see what the company wants and then communicate it to the uh, employer, communicate it to the tenant, the building, and clearly, most of all, to your employees. It's one of these issues that's going to come up because, you know, we are humans. All right, this will eventually end. We know that. So to prepare for the next one, and of course, there's going to be a next one, you know, learn and improve from the current one. So you can read all the events that I recommend, all the actions I recommend. Uh, right now, start today, conduct in-incident reviews. What's going on? What have we learned? What do we need to improve? When it's all over, gather your staff together, Conduct a post, what I call a post incident critique. Find out again what's going on. Gather all documentation, gather all files. You may need to conduct individual interviews with your staff, with your executives. You know, what did we learn? What needs to be improved? What worked? What didn't work? And then develop an action plan. In the next slide, in a minute, I'll show you the action plan, what it should look like. Then what do you do? You update your plans and procedures, your facilities and supplies. You prepare for the next one. 
You should know it's because it's going to be another one. People are going to rely on you. Make it happen. This is my recommended action plan template. So on the left, you know, a reference number. Then what are your items? What did you learn? What, what worked? What didn't work? What lessons learned do we need to uh, understand? The next column is how do we solve it? How do we fix it? We need more um, sanitizer. We need more of this. We need more of that. Or this team didn't work or that team did work. Great. What are the recommendations? Then the last three columns are extremely important. Assign the responsibility to somebody. It's not, we need more uh, sanitizer. We should have fewer meetings. Someone needs to be responsible for it. So list who the responsible person is, what department they are, give them a completion date. This can be negotiated, but give them a completion date. And then one of the best things I've used is a, what I call the stoplight chart on a, on a on an Excel spreadsheet, a Word document, whatever, um, list all these things. And then what is their current status? You can sort them by department. You can sort them by status. Red is not started. Yellow is underway. Green is completed. So when you go to management and say, look, here's a list of things that we learned from the pandemic. Here's what needs to be done. Human nature is I don't want my department all red. I want them at least yellow and green. This is a little leverage to make things happen that you uh, need to fix. And again, if you say to management, this is the list, it's their job to make it happen. You've done everything you can, you've done a great job. Now you have to make it happen, follow up and learn. Because in the next one, you don't want people saying, didn't we learn from the last one we should have done X? Well, yeah, that's a facility problem. Well, you don't want to be in that position, you want to cover your tails. So make sure you do it. The best way to do it is the action plan. Joe, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Now it's my pleasure to inter introduce Jenny Young, Chair again of the IFMA Asian Advisory Board for a uh, case study. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me. Good morning and good evening, everyone. So in the past five months, we have been going through the emotional roller coasters. We have been wearing masks everywhere, in the subway and even in the weddings and going to work. And we have been having a very big experience of working from home. This is the biggest global work from home experience that we have experiencing. Is it a failure or is it a success? We have been working from home. It seems that this is a very um, successful because um, people previously mentioned that they cannot, they have to have uh, the dependency in the office. They are not working from home. But is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? So COVID-19 has accelerated the path of change in the workplace and in our daily life. So let's go to the first polling questions. The first question is, I was well informed of the preventive measures to different pandemic threat levels that have been implemented in my workplace. Is it yes? Are you well informed? No, or you're not sure? So let's have a 10, 15 seconds to response. And this is related to the communications. Okay, so this is really good. Um, most of the people, 70% of the of um, the attendees of the audience are having well informed of the preventive measures. And 21%, no, they were not being informed. At 8%, they're not sure about this. So um, we can see that um, most of the company, we expect they will have a good communications to the employees. So when we have, um, we are aware of the um, pandemic level for the next slide, Chris. So we're going to the supply chain. The supply chain has been disrupting seriously. We see that um, most of the country during the outbreak in the developing level. So people are not able to buy the grocery and we have to line up for the face mask, and we even have to fight for a roll of toilet paper. And we are buying a lot of masks, we stock up to prepare ourselves, to keep ourselves safe, because we are not aware of the pandemic, and we don't know what is gonna happen. And the only way it seems to protect ourselves is to wear a face mask when going out. Okay, mm -hmm. so we go to the next polling questions. My organization provides sufficient PPE to staff and visitors, and I'm aware of the office adequate to keep ourselves safe. 
So are your company providing you the face masks, goggles, gloves, or other types of PPE, wipes, sanitizers that keep you safe? Is it true? Is it not? Or you don't feel safe in your workplace ever? Mm -hmm. So let's have a few more seconds for the audience to respond. All right, Chris, let's look into the result. Mm -hmm. This is a good result as well. So 84% of you are aware of the office adequate, how to behave well in the office to make ourselves and protect everyone safe. And the company is providing the PPE. 13% is false and 3% not sure about and not um, feeling safe in the workplace. So let's look into what happened to the 3%. So next slide. For the communications, we have to be very transparent because um, people are having different sources of information from the um, TV, from the WHO broadcasting, from the news channel, from the social media, and for the corporations, we also have um, CEO messaging broadcasting to all the employees. We have the information from our landlords, information from the FM. So this is very important we have the um, accurate information. So the next polling question, I have access to information regarding number of suspected or confirmed case, if any, within my organizations. Do you have the access? Yes, you have the access. No, you don't have the access, or you don't know whether you have this information at all. Chris, let's look into the result of the polling. <clears throat> so 62% of you are aware of the confirmed or suspected cases. 32% they don't, and 6% not sure about that. For the next slide, please, Chris. So this is communications polling. The communications is very important to prepare ourselves for return to work, return to site. This is important that we encourage our staff and visitors to report cases so that we have accurate information and we have um, the details to inform our employees. And for returning to sites, as um, Stephen has mentioned in the manuals, we prepare for the building, we prepare for the workplace, and we have the access control. When you look into the slides, we have um, the robotic cleaning, we have the disinfecting spraying for the office space, and we also have the control of access at the entrance to measure using the infrared temperature sensor to measure people's temperature, to make sure that no one gets fever or any syndrome of um, COVID-19 to enter the building to protect ourselves. Controlling access also including identifying the workplace, traffic patterns, how do you travel up or down, or you encourage people to take the elevator to travel up and take the stairs to go down, mark the rooms and to prevent people overcrowding in the rooms, saying to keep a social distancing, and how is the journey to work? How do you take your public transportation or you provide the transportation shuttle to your employees? And how do you manage the visitors, delivery people, courier, and also workers as well, if you have any work or project or maintenance going on in the premises? You have to give your employee a feeling of control. So this is very important. And a lot of the company in Asia are doing that. And in addition to the control, the office adequate that we just mentioned about is creating the social distancing plan and keep the team work going on even from a distance. So in a new situation after um, the COVID-19, we try to maintain a distance between two meters and eight meters. The two meter is for safety distance between each people and eight meters is keep ourselves connected with our employee and with our colleagues. And to reduce the touch point, increased cleaning is very important as well. So cleaning, we have talked, we are uh, also encouraging people to do the clean desk policy. But there is also an um, argument on that. The argument is um, people is having their personal desk. They have the personal belongings. So this is the, about the belongings. If you're asking people to perform the clean desk policy, are you taking away their loyalty to the company? the belonging to the office, the belonging to the community, whichever, whatever is um, more important. 
is the cleaning more important or the, the sense of belonging is more important? You don't have a yes or no answer, but you have to manage the people to manage your employee and employ your staff's expectations. So this is all about to keep people safe, a safer place with appropriate social distancing. But no one can guarantee whether you're safe in the office because even for WHO, we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a particular medication to cure COVID-19. So whatever we can do is to keep the people have a peace of mind and also to deliver the high performance workplace in the office. So the next slide, please. For the high performance workplace, while we're having a workplace, where well, workplace is to support the business success. And when we give a purpose for the people to come to the office, this is one of the essential elements to keep the business success as well. So it's about the feeling good for people to come to the office, to attract the millennials, attract our next generation of workforce, and to retain our talents, to make people feel proud and sense of community. And sometimes when we're keeping a distancing for too long a period of time, we're craving for connectivity as well. So that will create anxiety when we work from home for too long and we feel that disconnected with our team members. So we go to our next polling question. I have asked us to an employee assistant program, HR program or forum to express my views on safety. Do you have the answers or do you not having the answers? You're not sure that whether your company is offering this channel for you or your company does not have this kind of employee assistant program or feedback channel. So what is your situation? 79% of you have access to employee assistant program, which is really good because it's important that when we're going through the emotional roller coaster, we have someone to talk to and we can express our feeling. 8% of you doesn't have it. 6% you're not sure that whether you have this um, provisions for your company. And for another 8% that your company does not have an EAP program. So this is another way to manage um, employee expectations. When people coming back to the office, as Stephen has just mentioned, it's easy to go away from leaving the premises. But when going back to the office, we are facing a lot of uncertainties. We are facing a lot of the um, uncertainties about um, the safety, the cleanliness, as we have um, similar, similar questions from last part of the webinar. How frequent is the cleaning should be appropriate? So is it an hourly cleaning appropriate or two hours uh, two hour per time uh, is appropriate? And some of the companies are having the antiseptic sprays to have a continuous 24 hours um, disinfecting of the, the place. And some of the companies that is only two times a day. So whichever frequency you have, that will be um, depending on the frequency of the connectivity and frequency of using of the premises. So it's all about a comfortable, safe, flexibility approach on use of the space under the new normal. So in Asia, we're experiencing that. We don't have an answer of whether which protocol is the right protocol, but it's also according to the culture, according to the development of the COVID-19 situations, and also according to um, the feedback of the people from a communication channel. Okay, so Joe, so we hand over to Kathy for the next section. Thank you so much. Much, Jenny. Wonderful presentation, and it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Campbell again, National Director of Service Delivery, ABM Industries, Healthcare Division. Kathy. Thank you, Jenny. And I think uh, this is going to be a nice segue into environmental cleaning from the people perspective, uh, because uh, as your facilities are returning to normal occupancy levels, uh, providing a piece. Peace of mind is very important. So there's a heightened sense of scrutiny uh, for demonstrating that you're doing your part in providing a clean and healthy and safe environment. Through enhanced cleaning, you can be uniquely positioned to help pre prevent the spread of pathogens uh, by using a certified disinfection process and training program that's backed by experts. So when we boil it all down, it makes a holistic reentry program 
um, that works. Here's some bullets behind that. Protocols and recommendations are driven by a network of experts. Uh, specialized training on your new standard operating procedures for the new normal and specific disinfection services. Um, having a uniform national infrastructure and availability of labor for the organizations that are cleaning. Uh, supply chain purchasing power is important and also a best in class equipment and innovation program for infection prevention. We can go to the next slide. Uh, the first steps start with planning and preparing for building and uh, occupant health and safety. Uh, one of the first things you should do is perform a site assessment that includes the following things. Um, a thorough walkthrough using a facility re-entry checklist. And I think Dr. Goldman uh, referred to that. You need to identify those high touch points where frequent disinfection is needed and perform a checkup of your entire facility. You're gonna be looking at things like Jenny brought up. How do people move through the space? Identify the most effective locations to add hand sanitizing stations or disinfecting wipes. You'll want to evaluate opportunities to reduce high touch points by replacing uh, manual fixtures or dis, uh, dispensers with touchless products. And that's kind of a big, larger uh, project that you can begin talking about right now, because as Dr. Goldman said, this won't be the first pandemic we face. Um, Recommending the, uh, uh, an incorporation of centralized trash collection. This really helps support that social distancing practices. And finally, a, a comprehensive disinfection service should be performed by a certified disinfection specialist team uh, to prepare your, your space for re-entry. We can go to the next slide. Now, frequent high-touch disinfection is really based on a few key factors, uh, and I'm going to uh, remind you of something Dr. Goldman said in the previous uh, uh, presentation. You know, the density of traffic in buildings and frequent pathways uh, that the occupants, occupants take through a building is really important, understanding that. When a risk assessment is conducted with that facility manager, Intervals of disinfection could be based on a calculation of the average number of individuals entering a building, and maybe even uh, the average number of times an employee is moving from stationary locations throughout the day to, to visit restrooms, to, to, to go to a break room or the cafeteria, uh, or conference room visits, et cetera. So the frequency of movement throughout the day is also impacted by um, the type of work that's being done in the specific uh, spaces. Collaboration with your facility manager is going to be key to align with the frequency of focus on high touch areas. And the scope of work is determined by, by using those factors and pulling those key pieces of information together. After your program is in place, communication is elevated and a frequency of cleaning has changed occupants begin to notice the movement of custodial staff throughout the building and confidence in that new program is elevated and it begins to change and impact the occupants of the building. Upon re-entering, uh, providing occupant communication, um, Jenny referred to this, Dr. Goldman referred to this, maybe you should think about building kits that share ideas, uh, communication about re-entry protocols, it'll That'll prove beneficial to the occupants. Uh, you'll want to share details about any new signage, uh, floor signage, uh, hand sanitizer stations, where are they going to be located. You might want to leave tent cards where you have cleaned. You'll want to communicate about the new cleaning protocols, what that, that looks like, how, how often you'll see custodial staff coming through. And you'll want to tell your occupants what they can inspect, uh, expect in terms of their frequency uh, or the intervals of focus on those high-touch disinfection uh, routines throughout your building. And finally, uh, facility managers should standardize the cleaning supplies and equipment for high-touch cleaning programs. The first thing is that they need to have key protocols that should be implemented that are consistent. Um, 
You'll transition to EPA registered disinfectants. You may um, uh, address the provision of appropriate PPE that adheres to the label instructions on the disinfectant and also aligns with the type of equipment that you're using. And also then you'll wanna think about using reusable cleaning cloths and mops, maybe such as microfiber. So those are a few ideas about consistent protocols. Well, let's go to the next slide. I provided an, uh, an overview of high touch. Uh, so let's get a little bit more granular. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing about considering uh, electrostatic spraying, uh, maybe even antimicrobial surface coatings. Um, but I just want to say this kind of to build the foundation for making decisions about that. When you have focused on high touch cleaning uh, daily, uh, whether, however, whatever the frequency is, remember that you're mechanically wiping those spaces every day. You have cleaner surfaces uh, that are prepared for things like electrostatic spray. And this type of disinfection should only be scheduled periodically. Uh, when those particles uh, are released from electrostatic sprayers, they're drawn to that surface, they wrap around into crevices and around corners, and they provide that broader disinfection to all surfaces. But it really only needs to be done periodically. Other adjuncts to manual cleaning and wiping of surfaces are available to us. We're seeing them hit our inboxes every day. Uh, and these uh, types of items provide a continuum of disinfection in buildings today. Uh, everything from mobile uh, UV devices like the robots or surface wands for disinfection, disinfecting surfaces and keyboards. You'll hear about air filtration using global plasma solutions or ultraviolet light HVAC systems for cooling drains and uh, drain pans, or, or you'll hear about LED lighting that's safe for people and it's continually, uh, dis continually uh, disinfecting the environment and creating a healthy and healthier environment for your buildings. And here on my last slide, I'm gonna talk about uh, in this example that you see here, the high touch surfaces are detailed in yellow. Um, occupant communications should be posted uh, in your floor signage, which direction to go, how to walk, wall posters, you could use banners. This is a picture perfect plan. Uh, that deserves a sanitation verification program that goes beyond visual inspections. And that's just another one of those innovations that um, our clients and our facilities managers are looking at. How, what are mechanisms for sanitation verification? You might look at adenosine triphosphate, uh, an ATP swab testing, or surface imaging. Um, the actual taking of a picture that might reveal the bio load that's left on surfaces after cleaning. Uh, it's an important way for the custodial management team to increase the quality of cleanliness and, and provide that extra layer of confidence because this is what peace of mind looks like. So I'll turn it over for what's next. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, we're heading into our Q&A portion of this uh, broadcast. And I'd like to just remind the audience that you are able to submit uh, questions on the chat box. And I believe Chris is uh, uh, queuing those up for us. So at this point, I think we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, here's one from Keith Gaspara. What are the thoughts on confining people to specific areas of an office? to avoid cross-contamination from one area to another. Panelists, any takers? Uh, let me take that question. Okay, Jenny. Okay. So in Asia, we're ahead of the phase because uh, we have the outbreak earlier and we are returning to work um, most of um, um, a couple of weeks already. And um, one of the, um, of the approach to keep the social distancing is having different offices and split teams is one of the way because um, in the regular, in the original layout, so we have people um, sitting close to each other. But now when we have to keep a social distancing, we have to reduce the percentage of people in the office and we have to split the people into different locations. And um, people are splitting the teams and 
like team A will be working in the office while team B will be working from home. And then they, they switch the rotations of the shifts and they don't cross each other. And sometimes we have the COB site, the business continuity site, and we have different offices, site offices. So the different teams work into different offices and at the same time, they don't cross each other. For smaller offices, they would divide the space into different locations, different um, zones. And it's, as, uh, it's the same principle that um, the two teams will not cross each other. So this will be a temporary measure because I don't think personally, I don't think this will um, work for a long period of time because the team members and people will still needing to have the connectivities with each other to for the teamwork. So, um, but for the time being, because of the um, COVID-19 situations, the split operations and the separations of the song is very effective. And for some of the locations, we even have the segregation of lift. So people of different teams are using different lift zones and using different lift cars to go to different floors instead of having sharing the lift. So they feel more comfortable to have the peace of mind that they have a control and they are the only one using the particular reserve area. Um, that is very important for people to have this peace of mind when they're returning to site. I hope my answer Thank you, is Jenny. Answer. Thank you. Um, another, some other questions that are rolling in here. Uh, Ryan Inlow is asking, uh, relative to uh, restrooms, are air dryers or paper towels preferred to reduce touch points? Kathy, Dr. Goldman? Um, I, I can take that. I have, a, I have an opinion on that. I always like paper towels, that final mechanical action that, uh, you know, removes everything that you didn't uh, remove through soap and water off of your hands. And so I always like paper towels, but I think in today's climate, going touchless as much as we can uh, is appropriate. And so, um, you know, there's, I think, points of view on both sides of that. Excellent, thank you. A uh, few others, I gotta read through these. What are your thoughts on closing or removing ice, mach ice machines? We have hundreds of field workers who work outside and need ice when it's hot. Hadn't thought about that. Hmm. My recommendation would be, and, and if, as I'm envisioning this, are we talking about ice coolers? Maybe, possibly, multiple touch points uh, mm -hmm. close to that ice cooler. I would have some disinfectant wipes and you know communication to your team to take a personal responsibility to wipe those down every time they use it. I think we're all learning new lessons in how to uh, how to perform our jobs daily, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we have you know we had the Question, uh, actually, Kathy, you covered this really well. I learned a great deal when you talked about the the, the uh, work around cleaning the high touch points, the manual contact uh, cleaning, and then followed up with the, the sprayer. Uh, we've had a question over a couple of weeks here about sanitizers, disinfectants, sprayers. Could you elaborate more in, in that arena? Yeah, you know, um you might read on the CDC website or any research that you're doing that there's, you know, three types of removal of organisms or bioload. You'll see cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. In our world of cleaning, we clean and we disinfect. Uh, the sanitizing is uh, uh, is sometimes confusing because the word sanitizing and disinfecting is used interchangeably. Um, but sanitizing is really dedicated to food service. Uh, the sanitizers they use are not EPA registered disinfectants. Uh, they are um, regulated by the FDA uh, and they typically do not um, kill viruses. So uh, if we don't want to buy a sanitizer to use in our business, we want to either clean with an all-purpose cleaner and then disinfect or uh, in our world today, we have detergent, uh, disinfectants that have detergency in them. And so typically we have a one-step process of cleaning and disinfecting. And it's important, like I mentioned earlier, that we clean surfaces through mechanical action, 
uh, using a disinfectant to wipe the bio load away uh, before we um, proceed to an electrostatic sprayer. Because the electrostatic sprayer is going to, you know, if you don't clean surfaces and you think the electrostatic spraying can do everything for you, it will disinfect uh, initially, but then there's that buildup and you're never removing bio load. Uh, that can be problematic and create, um, you know, dermatitis on the skin, um, can create some problematic uh, issues for occupants of the building. Thank you. Uh, another question that's in, because um, we've talked a lot about, Dr. Goldman, you talked a lot about masks in one of the slides. Um, what about the use of gloves and the frequency of use and disposal of those of those PPE-related glove requirements? That's more Kath, Kath, your Jenny question. Um, I'd say use them all the time, but... I just wanted to hear you talk for a little bit. <laughs> Either one, Jenny, Kathy. Yeah. Um, for the face mask and the gloves, um, for um, like for for my company, uh, we have the guidelines to the the operation staff that um, they need to change it every four hours because um, that is something consumables. And um, when you get in touch with um, the areas, so it would get contaminated. So four hours will be a reasonable time. Um, we don't have any um, medical um, details on that, but um, as a best practice, um, when you getting off work or when you're getting off the um, duty positions, so you replace it. And um, if you're wearing it for a long time, so you replace it every four hours. So that will be a good practice frequency for replacing the PPE. Thank you. How prevalent is directional stairway signage um, as a requirement? That is related to the um, control part. So mm -hmm. um, in in the in the experience we mentioned about um, um, we sometimes we have the guidelines for some of the companies to um, ask the employees to um, to maintain the distancing by using different types of the travelators and elevators and stairs. So um, one of the suggestion is to suggest people use elevator to move up the premises, and then when you when they leave or when they do the interval traveling they use the stairs to go down so it's healthier for you as well and um, at the same time you segregate people so you have a one-way flow uh, for the lobbies and for the um, staircase that you always go down for the staircase and um, travel in one directions in the uh, elevator lobbies to avoid people crossing each other Hey, Joe, I have something to add to that. Um, that's very good because it really aligns with uh, as we re-enter the workspace and we're looking at the frequency of cleaning. Um, this weekend, I was in a couple of commercial spaces. Uh, I was in a retail space and there's arrows on the floor, you know, directional um, pathways of how you move through a building. This is very helpful on the re-entry as we define the density of traffic, as we are defining the surfaces that people are touching as they come in the building, and that helps align with our re-entry program for how often we're going to clean those uh, stairway handrails, uh, elevator buttons, uh, you know, how we move to a restroom and what's the pathway when we leave the restroom uh, and it helps us identify those high touch areas for that re-entry. Of course, it has to be revisited after things come back to normal, um, but I think it's a really good alignment of thinking. Wonderful. I think we have time for an, one, one or two more questions. One more question. Here's one from Alberto Reyes. What would you suggest to ensure constant compliance to physical distancing inside crew cars and cabins, lunch areas, uh, construction areas? Workers are physically stressed and will mo most likely get lower body resistance. I think I think that's uh, stress related. Um, I think that that's what's being asked here. Any thoughts, anyone? Does that go back to our our pathway? Um, following protocols? You know, something I noticed in Jenny's slides um, when she was looking at high performance workplaces, and also there was a, a slide where a, a gal was sitting 
having lunch or something and there was some red X's. It's a table for four, but there were some red X's where uh, it's implied without really speaking it that this is um, not where you sit, but this is where you sit. And I think those uh, underlying uh, communications that are not so in obtrusive and uh, kind of punitive uh, are better. I really appreciated that slide, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was excellent. A subtle but direct uh, message. Um, uh, Kathy, you spoke to, in, in, in your presentation, you spoke to um, um, certified products, right? Things that e get the EPA standards, et cetera. A lot of emerging technologies. Are there are there some things to look for, uh, things to look out for? Uh, can you highlight any of that? Yeah, probably many of you are getting lots of emails today from the you know the manufacturers out there. They're coming out of the woodwork. Uh, and one example I can give you is on antimicrobial surface coatings. Um, these have been around for. 10, 15 years, and you got to ask yourself, why are we not using them? Uh, and then every time a, uh, an event comes up in our region, uh, an epidemic, a pandemic, then they come out of the woodwork. And I would just give you a few guidelines as these um, come across your desk. Uh, research their website. On their website, if, they're, if they have had any testing that validates their marketing claims, for antimicrobials, uh, they'll say 30, 60, 90 days of continual disinfection. Um, if in fact they can state on their website that they've had a study that proves their marketing claims, or they've done some testing uh, that proves their marketing claims, then I'd say, you know, make a phone call, dig a little deeper. But if they're if they don't have that on their marketing, page, they probably don't have it at all. And so think about science-based, the questions that you ask for new innovations. What kinds of studies have been conducted? How long have you been around in the marketplace? Can you scale up to uh, you know, the, the inventory that we would need if we used your product? And so there, you, you need to dig a little deeper, but Many of those you can let just pass through if you go to their website and you don't find anything that indicates that they've had, you know, a study that that support their claims. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, uh, thank Chris. We were uh, going to identify some various programs and items here. Did you want to take that back, or you want me to? This is yeah, this is Dr. Right, thanks so okay. much. Uh, and and everybody, we've got a lot of great resources to help you with your road to recovery. Um, so to go through these quickly, we've got the MIT Crisis Management and Business Continuity course, and that's coming up on the 21st and 28th uh, through the 30th of uh, July. So please check that out at that URL. Uh, and then also um, kind of the, the foundation provided by the foundation of this entire course uh, uh, session today is the pandemic manual. So you can get a free copy of that if you go to the foundation's website, foundation.ifma.org slash news slash publications, um, put in your name, email address, and you'll have the entire pandemic manual uh, for free. And as I mentioned, that was provided generously by the IFMA Foundation and the support of ABM and the sponsors that we mentioned at the, at the top of the session. So thank you so much to every, uh, all of them uh, for producing that. And this episode and all past episodes are available, um, as I mentioned, on our uh, Coronavirus Resource Center. So go to ifma.org slash coronavirus to check this episode out, get the slide deck, and also be able to view uh, all past episodes. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing the future office. That's going to be episode 11 in the series. Um, so it's also Wednesday, 10 a.m. Central Time. So please register for that. We'll be sending a follow up email to everybody uh, with the full recording and links to where you can get all these awesome resources. So we are very excited. Thank you so much to the panelists for all of your expertise. Thank you to the very engaged audience for all of the questions you submitted. And we'll see everybody back here next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central.